in the crossfire of a lover's triangle. Here's Keith Morrison. What was she thinking when she went to the computer, when she typed in those five little words? Did she not understand where those little words might lead? Michelle Thier was, no doubt about it, dissatisfied. Here she was, young, successful, attractive, and yet... It wasn't exactly boredom that was eating at Michelle. After all, she was just starting a new career as a psychologist, often counseling troubled couples. She was relatively new with her license. I think that was her first real job. Of course, Michelle would have laughed at the idea that pretty soon now... Events would propel her to such notoriety that newspaper reporters like Melissa Stoddard Diaz would be poking around in her past. Michelle, from um, everyone I've spoken to, wanted to be somebody and really worked hard to get to where she ultimately got her degree and, and became a professional. But then Michelle, even at an early age, always seemed confident about getting what she wanted. She was just 16 when she started dating Marty. Marty Thier was a couple of years older, worldly, bright, friendly, had big plans. He wanted to be an astronaut. He went to the Air Force Academy. She was 20 when she married him at the Academy's famous chapel outside Colorado Springs. Marty, you may kiss your bride. This was back in 1991 when Marty was all she ever wanted. Long before she talked to that psychologist, agreed to record for the record her thoughts about the weird events yet to come, and those happy days with Marty, too, of course. We did everything together. He treated me really well. <laughs> we had the perfect relationship. We were best friends. He was the dashing young officer back then. She, his lovely bride. The future, she imagined, an endless honeymoon in which Marty's Air Force career would take them to exotic destinations all around the world. She just didn't imagine that world would be unromantic Air Force outposts in Oklahoma and Alabama and Florida and finally Fayetteville, North Carolina. They came here in 1999. Marty was Captain Thier by then, flew one of those huge C-130 cargo planes. All that time alone. Not so easy on a marriage. As she revealed during those tape-recorded interviews with psychologist Dr. Deborah Layton Thole. Michelle talked about a few problems in the marriage, primarily growing apart over the years. Marty was away for extended periods of time. She had a hard time with that. It was getting more difficult for her. She was lonely. Sometimes he was gone for months. And when he finally did come home, Military families have come to know that adjustment period all too well. They bickered, they argued about her housekeeping, his job, about having children. He wanted them, she didn't. She was worried she'd be stuck raising them by herself in a town where she was already miserable and lonely. There was a Fayetteville, Loserville, and I had nobody to hang out with. Nobody I could pick up the phone and call. That actually is about the time it started. Harmless, really, just a few key strokes. See what might happen. Goes on all the time these days on the Internet. Sexy brunette seeks rendezvous man. And before long, her Internet inquiry got a response from him. His name was John, John Diamond. John loved women. John was a ladies' man. John always had girlfriends. So... Debbie Dvorak, John's kid sister, could certainly see her brother responding to a solicitation like Michelle's. My brother's got a great personality. He's an attractive guy, and, you know, his personality makes him that much more attractive. Then, a few days after meeting online, they met in person at a local restaurant. John Diamond was an Army Ranger, based at Fort Bragg, trained as a sniper. Highly regarded, decorated. He'd been in the service since he was 18. 
By all accounts, he was a good soldier, but he was a, he was a playboy himself. He had been married once before and had a child from his first marriage, and he left the first wife and married, and they had a son together. Michelle didn't know that John was still married, but maybe it didn't matter, at least not then. She loved the sex, the attention, the excitement. What made her so desirable to him? I think it was just the sex. That was what he was obsessed with. He was smitten with having sex with her. For Michelle, well, it was more lust than love. She felt that the affair did not take away from the fact that she loved Marty. She said he was the love of her life uh, and that she never loved John Diamond. And Marty? He was in the dark, of course. When Michelle told them their marriage was in crisis and they needed to see a counselor... He wouldn't agree with counseling and I'm in doubt. He was shocked. Michelle got her own place and spent much of that steamy Fayetteville summer with John Diamond. He was so attentive. He would run my feet for five hours if I wanted to. Diamond was apparently nuts about Michelle. Never met anyone like her before. She challenged him in ways he'd never been challenged before. Paul Wolverton is a reporter with the Fayetteville Observer. She was strong and intelligent and exciting for him. But was he enough for her? Apparently not, because after three months on her own, Michelle went back to Marty. She felt that the marriage could survive, despite everything that had happened, uh, that they could make it. So John and Michelle's six-month affair seemed to be off. But then a few weeks later, it was apparently back on. The two traveled to the tropical island of Saba, where Michelle interviewed for a job at a local university. And later that fall, a romantic rendezvous at a Raleigh hotel where they celebrated Michelle's 30th birthday. But Michelle, as she would later tell the psychologist, insisted it was just a relapse. I knew that I loved Marty, and I knew that I wanted to make it work in my heart. But John Diamond was devastated, or so said Michelle. He said specifically, I'm going to kill myself, I can't live without you, you can't do this to me, I'm going to go drive my car on the bridge. It was awful, said Michelle. Diamond kept calling, made a scene at her office in front of some students she taught, even threatened to call Marty and tell him everything. So, nearly a week after that romantic night in Raleigh, Michelle says she met John at a local restaurant to end the affair. Gently, but for good. We had the whole talk, you know, we could never happen again, never, never, never. He seemed very calm, very rational. So now it was December, time for peace and joy and Christmas parties. One in particular at which the spirits flowed and the fuse burned down to its explosive end. Somebody was about to die. And somebody else wasn't taking any chances on missing. It wasn't like bang, 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 bang. It was bang, pause, bang, pause. Which sounds more like what? An execution? You could take it that way, yes. When Deadly Triangle continues... In the heart of the American Bible Belt, on the fringe of vast sprawling army and air force bases, like a patient accommodating landlord, is Fayetteville, North Carolina. Imagine most of a suburban strip mall devoted to strip clubs, and a downtown which is charming, elegant even, and a scene about everything. It's an old town, Fayetteville. That tower marks the spot where North Carolina ratified the federal constitution back in 1789. I'm standing on what was a slave market. Sherman fought battles here in the Civil War. But now it's a military town, and 160,000 acres back there is the Army's Fort Bragg, where soldiers prepare to go to war. Nestled up beside that is Pope Air Force Base. 
two institutions, two professional military men, one woman. And that woman, Michelle, now found herself caught between her husband, Air Force Captain Marty Thier, and her former lover, Army Ranger John Diamond, who just wouldn't go away. I told him I don't want to leave my husband. I never told him I love you. I never said I want to be with you. I mean, I think I was pretty straight up. So now, with the holiday season at full swing and a new commitment to her marriage, Michelle and Marty were on the road to Raleigh for a night out. Traveling with them was another couple from her office. They had gone to this Christmas party that she specifically asked her boss if Marty could go. It was sedate by office party standards and over early, since Marty had to fly first thing in the morning. So now it was 9.30 p.m. Marty, Michelle, and the co-workers prepared to leave the restaurant. Then, an interruption. Michelle excused herself made a brief phone call out of earshot of the others. Then the drive to Fayetteville, one hour. They dropped the other couple at Michelle's office, then left for home, stopped on the way for gas. And then, sitting at the gas pump, Michelle told Marty she'd forgotten something at the office. I ended up turning around and going back to the office to get some stuff that I needed so that I could stay up from work that night. Marty parked behind the office building. Michelle walked up an outside staircase, disappeared inside. Marty waiting in the car. Apparently, he got impatient, headed up the stairs to check out Michelle. And that's when it happened. She found him, she said, at the bottom of that outside stairway. She could see the blood. She ran to the nearest store, called 911. Within minutes, Fayetteville police and paramedics arrived, and they found Michelle cradling her husband in a pool of blood. But it was too late. Marty Thier was dead. He was just 31. Because Marty was an Air Force captain, military investigators were soon on the scene as well as police, making this a joint investigation with the Fayetteville PD. Both teams were eager to speak to the only known witness, Michelle Thier, Office of Special Investigations Agent Vince Bustillo. She said she heard what sounded to her like three bangs of a car backfiring. And did she tell you what she did at that point? She then opened the door and noticed that her husband was laying at the bottom of the stairs. She told them she thought she saw somebody moving in the bushes near the stairway, but she wasn't sure. Initially, I think police were looking at perhaps a robbery of some type. Detectives combed the parking lot surrounding area, but found no one on this cold, dark December night. There was a man who lived behind the office building who heard the shots fired, who later said that he said, somebody's getting murdered out there because of the, the order in which the shots were fired. They were very calculated. It wasn't like bang, 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 bang. It was bang, pause, bang, pause. Uh, a space between each of the five shots. Which sounds more like what? An execution? You could take it that way, yes. At the top of that stairway were a few clues. Bullet holes sprayed in the wall. Sequins from Marty's holiday suspenders littered the landing. Looked like he was at the top of the stairs, shot from down below. And I think that's what made him roll down the stairs, and the final shot was to the back of his left ear. The kill shot? The kill shot. Close range. They found shell casings in the parking lot. Appeared to be from a 9mm handgun. But there were no fingerprints, no footprints, no useful DNA. But investigators did find Marty's wallet, still on him, complete with cash and credit cards. Marty Thier was not robbed. The other thing was that it was a very, very cold night. Not a night where a prowler would be out on the streets just looking to find someone. It made it very suspicious. Investigators couldn't imagine who would want to kill such a wonderful man like Captain Marty Thier. But of course, out in this dark parking lot, they didn't know any of what you know, not yet anyway. Assuming what you've heard so far is the real story, and, as you'll see, 
The question of what was true and what wasn't could be very tricky indeed. Coming up, Michelle said she'd gone back to her office because she'd forgotten something. So, what took so long? They found a candy wrapper that had been opened and then in the trash can. It was almost like a scene where she had just gone upstairs and sat and waited for a few minutes. Or what? When Dateline continues. It was a week before Christmas 2000, and Fayetteville was aglow, but not everywhere with the lights of Christmas. And a few hours after Air Force Captain Marty Thier turned up dead in the parking lot of his wife's office building, the news was out, and it was big. Michelle Thier, now Marty's grieving widow, told the police she was inside her office looking for a book when she heard someone firing outside. By all counts, it was an assassination. Greg Butler was a deputy district attorney in Fayetteville at the time. Somebody went to kill Marty Thier that night. There was no evidence of any robbery. There was no evidence of any other um, thing going on here. Though inside Michelle's office, what they found seemed, well, a little odd, maybe. And that she'd gone to the bathroom. The, the toilet had not been flushed. They found a candy wrapper that had been opened and then in the trash can. It was almost like a scene where she had just gone upstairs and sat and waited for a few minutes because obviously to find a book wouldn't take yeah, very long. Yeah. Strange. Hard to know what it meant, if anything. As dawn approached, Michelle was allowed to go home. And later that morning, her boss arrived. So the cops talked to him, too. During that interview, that it came out that she was having marital problems and was having some extra uh, marital affairs. Funny. Michelle hadn't mentioned anything about that. So detectives went to her house to follow up. And sure enough, Michelle did admit having an affair with Staff Sergeant John Diamond. Michelle also said she hadn't spoken to Diamond in two days. But when pressed, she remembered trying to call him unsuccessfully just before leaving that Christmas party, about 90 minutes before Marty was murdered. So detectives decided to check their cell phone records and discovered... They've been calling each other regularly, minimum 20 times a day. The now detectives paid a visit to John Diamond, who freely admitted having a sexual relationship with Michelle, but claimed she was just one of many ladies in his life. And as for the night of the murder, he had an alibi. He was home with his family, watching a movie. Still, Michelle must have harbored some sort of suspicion about John Diamond, who is now a person of interest. Not long after the murder, as she told detectives and that psychologist, she went to see Diamond, conduct her own investigation, find out what he knew about Marty's death. I said, do you know anything about this? Do you know anybody who had anything to do with this? She said, no, I would never do anything to hurt you. I know how much you love him. I believe that he looked so trustful. Mind you, as police were soon aware, Michelle had many opportunities to question her friend John after her husband died. There were witnesses showing that he parked down a little side street and then walked through their yards, going in the back door of her house. He couldn't stay away from Hell her. Hell yeah. He was going there and then staying all night. Not commonly the way widows grieve, spending the night with the person of interest in her husband's murder. But Michelle told psychologist Dr. Deborah Layton Thole she needed support from someone, anyone. As she felt more alienated from family and friends and more threatened by the police. The only person in her life that was willing to be there for her was John Diamond. I knew that I was depressed, and I was getting more and more depressed. And I say that I went to John for comfort. In fact, just a few weeks after Marty's murder, Michelle and John drove to Florida for a long weekend. Michelle wanted to see a former professor for grief counseling, she said later while Diamond stayed with his sister, Debbie. He acted as if nothing was wrong, because he knows he didn't have anything to do with it. He didn't shoot him. So, who did kill Captain Frank Martin Thier? Was it possible John Diamond actually executed his romantic rival? He may have had a motive. Police were very suspicious. But the physical evidence was, frankly, rather weak. 
So detectives kept digging in the arcane world of phone records. Boring, but sometimes revealing. And one telephone number in particular caught their attention. A call from Diamond to one of his army buddies at Fort Bragg. So we asked him if Diamond had any access to any weapons. He said that he loaned uh, Diamond his personal uh, pistol. Which just happened to be a 9mm Beretta pistol. The same kind of gun that killed Marty Thier. John Diamond had actually borrowed the gun from him during the time frame of when the murder occurred. He had, John Diamond had possession of it. Detectives were now convinced that Diamond not only had access to a gun, but maybe even the actual murder weapon. Did he still have it? Well, apparently not. Because just a short time after cops went to the home of Diamond's Arby buddy asking about that gun, Diamond made a phone call to Fort Bragg and reported that his car, which he claimed to have left in the base parking lot, had been broken into, and one of the things stolen from it was a 9 millimeter handgun. When we got there, the, the passenger door had already been opened, and there was a pile of glass sitting next to the rocker panel on the passenger side. But if you look on the inside, there was very little glass. What did that tell you? He had the door open when he broke the window and then tried to make it look like it was broken in. A bogus break-in? Military police sure thought so. John Diamond was arrested for admitting that he brought an unregistered gun on base. Clearly, Diamond was now the prime suspect in the murder of Captain Marty Thier. But was he really the killer? Coming up... A secret about John and Michelle's steamy affair becomes very public. She was taking him to these sex clubs and saying, it's okay, go, you know, if you want to have sex with her, that's fine. And he just, wow, okay. When Deadly Triangle continues. Fascinating how this machine has altered the field on which cheating spouses play their secret games. Because once a key is struck, is anything secret anymore? A few weeks after the murder of Captain Marty Fear, while police chased more earthbound clues, a Fayetteville police detective named C.T. Williams was asked to have a look at a couple of computers seized from Michelle Thier's home, see if they might contain any clues. I just was looking for documents or text messages or emails. Like an onion, he peeled back the layers of text which, though they'd been deleted, reappeared under his expert touch. Boxes of deleted documents, 88,000 of them, buried deep inside Michelle's hard drive and out spilled some of Michelle's most intimate sexual secrets. She seemed to be seeking affairs with a number of people over time. She was looking for an alternative lifestyle. She was seeking a partner and escort for sexual swinger type clubs. That would be Carolina Friends, a swingers club. It boasted more than 10,000 members. And within Michelle's lengthy list of emails, detectives also discovered that not-so-innocent inquiry she typed seeking a rendezvous man. That was John Diamond, of course, who replied, and who, the email trail revealed, quickly joined Michelle in the lifestyle. She was taking him to these sex clubs and saying, it's okay, go, you know, if you want to have sex with her, that's fine. Go, I'm fine with it. And he just, wow, okay. But as investigators sorted through the sexually charged email, they could plainly see a story as old as time. John Diamond fell head over heels in love with Michelle. He was her little puppy to be controlled any way she wanted to control. He was like the child in the relationship. Whatever she wanted was, he was at her beck and call. Hundreds upon hundreds of lurid, lovesick emails. John Diamond appeared to be a man obsessed. I can't wait till you come back so we can take care of each other. You know, sex, 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 and of course, more sex. I know that we're meant to be together and are kindred soulmates. I will always love you, no matter how you've hurt me. 
but you could tell it was not only changed from a sexual relationship to completely, totally enamored with her in any, on all, in any way you can imagine. And he was getting desperate to he be was, with he her. He wants to be with her. His plans were to be with her. He was willing to do anything to keep the woman he's in, totally in love with. Anything? Perhaps even kill the man who stood between him and Michelle? She was beginning to set him up. She was playing his emotions. She was pushing him away, she kind of. She pushed him away in some ways, but without really completely pushing him away. Push uh, I think she was manipulating him at that point. Manipulating him into murdering her husband? But why would she want to do that? There was a $500,000 life insurance policy that had been taken out in 1999 on uh, Marty Thier. And the sole beneficiary? Michelle Thier. John Diamond's family was outraged at such a theory. They were convinced Michelle typed all those emails and sent them to herself to steer investigators away from her and to Diamond, so he'd take the rap. He never once expressed a love feeling about her to me. So unless you come to me with a handwritten letter that he was obsessed with her, I'll never believe that. But how do you know that? Because he told me he did not want to marry her. He did not want to spend the rest of his life with her. According to Debbie, it was Michelle who was obsessed with John. And never more so than when she gave Debbie two wedding rings to take to her brother, who was by this time locked in the brig. I think maybe she was obsessed with him in the point that she couldn't control him, that she couldn't, you know, control the situation. She wanted to control it, and if she gave him a wedding ring and he wore it, wouldn't that give her all kinds of reason to claim that he would do anything for her, including kill her husband. That could be. I don't, I don't know. What I got from him after he was arrested was he didn't want anything to do with her. Nothing. But with or without Michelle, John was in big trouble. So he lawyered up with prominent Fayetteville attorney Coy Brewer. I believe that he was an innocent man wrongly accused, that any rational interpretation of the circumstantial evidence is consistent with Sergeant Diamond not being the shooter. But military investigators were convinced Diamond was the trigger man and decided to quickly proceed with their case against him. And Michelle remained free. And what did she do? Well, she left town. I think she planned to kill her husband a long time ago. I think she waited and researched and waited for that right person that would look and fit the part to pin it on. If that was true, Michelle's plan was working perfectly because in a few short weeks, John Diamond would be on trial for murdering her husband. Coming up, the prosecution's case against John and the defense's case against Michelle. Michelle there was a brilliant, cunning, ruthless, woman who wanted her husband dead when dateline continues in the dead center of fort bragg north carolina is a nondescript red brick building no colonnades no corinthian flourishes no palladian doodads just justice military style this is where Army Staff Sergeant John Diamond found himself, a prime suspect in the murder of Air Force Captain Marty Thier. Military justice is much swifter than civilian justice. So he goes to the Article 32 hearing, which is like the grand jury. They immediately find cause and they charge him. And nine months after the murder, in a small Fort Bragg courtroom, Diamond went on trial before a military jury. Diamond was very, very cocky at the beginning. He would laugh and joke with reporters in there. He was just so sure that he was going to be acquitted. But John Diamond wasn't the star of his own trial. Michelle was. She was free as a bird then, though still under investigation by Fayetteville civilian homicide cops. And here she was, called to testify at her former lover's military trial. She shows up, her hair is now like a red color that she's colored it, she's lost a bunch of weight, and she's got a gaggle of media following her into the building. It was all image, no substance. Michelle took the stand, but took the fifth. The prosecution's case against Diamond, its accusation was simple. Driven by his obsession for Michelle, he conspired with her to kill her husband, 
by borrowing the gun, arranging to be in a position in that dark parking lot, waiting until Marty Thier had placed himself in the kill zone at the top of the staircase outside Michelle's office, and fired the five shots that killed him. As for Diamond's alibi, that he was home with his wife watching a movie, that now ex-wife came to court and told the jury that the evening wasn't quite like that. Halfway through the movie, his phone rang, she said, and suddenly he was gone. What's more? Her mother heard him come home, you know, in the wee hours and wash clothes. True? Maybe not, said defense attorney Coy Brewer. Her story changed after she talked to police. She was afraid of the government. I don't think that she was telling the truth. Had she been pressured? Besides, said the defense, there was no DNA, no footprints, no fingerprints to prove Diamond shot Marty Thier. And anyway, Diamond was a trained sharpshooter, but the shots that felled Marty were sloppy, most of them badly aimed. Must have been the work of an amateur, said Diamond's attorney. An amateur like Michelle... Michelle Thayer had asked for the gun several days before the murder. She had told him that her husband had been abusive, that she was afraid of him. So he gets a gun, he gives her the gun. Now, he didn't think she was going to kill him with the gun. Did she just use him, know that he was somebody she could use to serve her purposes? She set this up to kill her husband because she wanted the insurance money and for Sergeant Diamond to take the fall. Michelle there was a brilliant, cunning, ruthless woman who wanted her husband dead. The military jury, however, didn't see it quite that way. The verdict was swift, guilty as charged, and from that moment on, his demeanor changed. I mean, it was like somebody just sucked the air out of him. The John Diamond full of bravado and, and ego just shriveled away. Diamond was sentenced to life in prison without parole. His family was furious, convinced he was framed. You don't expect to be convicted on theory and myth and what ifs. Show me blood, show me a gun, show me the timeline that works. Show me those facts. I'll believe till the day I die that she killed her husband, that she planned to have my brother go down for it so she could live this happy, wonderful life. Curious thing, that. As John Diamond settled into a life in prison, people around Fayetteville could see, to their great disapproval, that Michelle went on with a life uninterrupted. And then, quite suddenly, they didn't see her at all. Because Michelle feared disappeared. Michelle wasn't just a missing woman. She was also now a wanted woman. There's some speculation that she was tipped off that she had been indicted because she seemed to really sort of fall off the face of the earth. And coming up next Friday on Dateline, the preacher's wife. He seemed so perfect the small-town preacher and his soft-spoken wife. Then he was found dead, and she was under arrest for murder. I see a cold-blooded killer. What was behind this sensational crime? At last, Mary Winkler breaks her silence. What is in your heart at that very moment? Leavenworth Federal Prison. Doing time doesn't come much harder than it does here. This is where John Diamond was now serving a life sentence for murdering Air Force Captain Marty Thier. But his former lover, Michelle, seemed to have dropped right out of sight. Where was she? People weren't seeing her around Fayetteville. The DA, meanwhile, was convinced she must have conspired with John Diamond to kill her husband. She was the brains, he was the brawn or, in this case, the shooter. Though it was all circumstantial, said Greg Butler, it was persuasive. There was a significant amount of evidence. and I don't think there was any question as to who was involved, Diamond and her together. The evidence? The life insurance, the affair, the access to a murder weapon, those emails, the cover-up. 
Taken together, it was enough to convince a grand jury. And finally, in May of 2002, nearly 18 months since her husband was killed, Michelle Thier was indicted for first-degree murder and conspiracy. But arrested? No. Why? There's some speculation that she was tipped off that she had been indicted because she seemed to really sort of fall off the face of the earth right before that came down. Michelle Thier vanished. No one, not even her family, knew where she was. Lauderdale by the Sea is a charming little town, just north of Miami, quaint and quiet, low profile. In the summer of 2001, Cindy Geezy, a local landlord, met with a woman who wanted to rent a room at her cottage. She gave her name as Liza Pendragon. I let her sign a six-month lease. She seemed well-spoken, intelligent. She told me that she was on the run from an abusive boyfriend in California. Liza told everyone she was a teacher. She was looking for a job. She made friends around the neighborhood. Before long, she had a new beau. Liza, it was really Michelle, of course, kept in touch with her family very carefully, secretly. She only called on pay phones, for example, and that rarely. Two months after Michelle arrived in Florida, she asked her boyfriend to call her parents, pass on a message, use a pay phone, she told him. And maybe he forgot, or perhaps she didn't tell him why, but he called from his parents' house phone. U.S. Marshals were monitoring. They looked up the number that had called Michelle's parents. And the database told them that this woman had a son in his mid-twenties who lived in South Florida. Did he know the missing Michelle? The cops found him, staked him out, then followed him to that little white beach cottage where he and Michelle were in for a big surprise. Following a developing story out of Florida, a woman wanted for the murder of her husband, a Pope airman, has been arrested in Florida. At the time of her arrest inside the apartment, we found magazines uh, describing ways to go undercover in the United States, uh, obtain new identity. Books, too, on learning Spanish, travel guides for several Latin countries, an array of fake IDs. And then there was Michelle's appearance. She had changed her appearance, cut and dyed her hair, had some plastic surgery done. Do you have anything at all to say? Make any comment? A few days later, Michelle, her face still red and swollen and smeared with ointment from cosmetic surgery, was driven back to Fayetteville. She was charged with first-degree murder and locked up without bail. And two years later, in September 2004, after turning down a plea deal that would have imprisoned her for 10 years, the prosecutor laid out his case against Michelle Thier. She was the mastermind behind this whole thing. She induced John Diamond into doing whatever she wanted and used sex as a way to do that and had him convinced that she was a victim of spousal abuse and that Marty needed to die. The proof? For one thing, all those intimate emails which showed, said the prosecutor, how Michelle manipulated Diamond into a fatal frenzy and made him her fall guy. She got John down to the point that he was so upset that if he couldn't have her, he was willing to kill himself. If you're willing to kill yourself, it would not take much for you now to redirect that and kill someone else. Michelle directed him and got to the point where he was willing to kill Marty. That point arrived, said the prosecutor, after that office Christmas party, when Michelle called Diamond to tell him that she and Marty were heading to the kill zone, the parking lot of her office building. But she needed him there alone. So after they dropped two co-workers at the lot, said the prosecutor, Michelle made a crucial move that inextricably linked her to the murder. Remember, the thieves began driving home, stopped for gas. But then Michelle, by her own admission, had Marty return to the office supposedly to pick up some work she needed. And while she dawdled in the office, Marty became impatient, went up those stairs to check on her, and thus walked into an ambush. When they left, there would be no way for that shooter to have any reason to believe that they were coming back unless he had known to prior conversation with Michelle Thier. He was going to bring him back to that location, go up into her business, leaving him outside the door so that he could then murder her husband. 
That was really your smoking gun. That was the smoking gun that tied her to it. Michelle did not testify, nor did John Diamond. Her attorney belittled the state's evidence as thin and circumstantial. Among those speaking for Michelle, psychologist Dr. Deborah Layton Thole. She'd been hired by the defense, remember, to interview Michelle about her relationships, to testify as an expert witness. Those were the recorded conversations, excerpts of which you heard earlier. The doctor told the jury Michelle wasn't manipulating Diamond by stopping and starting their illicit romance. No, it was something else. When somebody's in a long-term affair, there does tend to be a pattern of pulling away and then coming back together, an inability to be decisive. That's not unusual with affairs. Besides, claimed the defense, being involved with another man didn't mean Michelle was also involved in murder. The two sides battled through three months of trial time, from Labor Day past Thanksgiving. Eleven-week trial, three-hour deliberation. The verdict? Guilty. She stood up, you know, they, they put the handcuffs on her, and, and, and she, she walked out of the courtroom, and, and she never looked back into the courtroom area, not even to, toward her family. Michelle Thier now sits in a North Carolina prison, halfway across the country from her co-conspirator, John Diamond. Today, these former lovers share only one thing, life without parole, each blaming the other for the murder of Air Force Captain Marty Thier, which keeps some people wondering, what really happened in that cold, dark North Carolina night? His supporters are heartfelt in their certainty that she was the bad one. She did it all. And he know, didn't do and anything. her supporters all blame him and say that he did it with, without her knowledge because he was in love with her and she was breaking up with him. Also and, a possibility. Yeah, well, you know, or they both did it together, which is the most likely possibility, which is what the jurors all, in both cases believed. Michelle Thier rolled the dice. She turned down a deal which would have released her before long. Instead, the woman who followed her dissatisfaction to an internet romance went on trial and as a result will die in prison. She probably led him on a roller coaster ride of emotions, um, brought him to the peak thinking that everything was going to be good and that they were going to lead this life together off some Caribbean island mm -hmm. uh, and then would back off and, and leave Diamond emotionally distraught to the point where that's what he wanted and nothing was going to get in his way. From my opinion, if he had wanted to, um, to shoot someone, he could have, he could have shot someone from a mile away. Why, why sneak right up on somebody and shoot them five times? And even according to the coroner, they're all over the place. Whoever shot that weapon wasn't a sharpshooter, didn't know how to shoot a weapon, you know, was scared to be there, whatever. It was, they were all over the place. They were ricocheting off of this and ricocheting off of that. There was just no way. Our defense in the case mm -hmm was that Michelle Thier was the shooter, and he was not. And it was her intent to set him up to take the fall for the shooting. Now, I think it's sometime after the shooting, he tried to cover up for both of them. And there's no question in my mind that he was guilty of accessory after the fact of murder. But it remains my abiding conviction that she, rather than he, was the shooter, and he was actually not involved in the shooting itself. People have said that Michelle manipulated and had a great deal of influence over John Diamond. I'm not so sure about that. I, I find that hard to believe. He, he was a trained sniper in the, in the Army. I, I find it really hard to believe that because of her sexuality or even her intelligence, if you want to emphasize that, uh, that she had this control over this, this man who was trained in control.
She was uh, always a little apprehensive, always looking over her shoulder. That's the only thing I found a little strange about her. Um, I was talking with her one day right out here in front of her apartment, and uh, there was a helicopter.